Hello, everybody. Um, we're not so many, so we can keep it very intimate and very, very informal. Uh, my name is Sam Bardewell. Um, I'm going to be moderating this panel, and um, I would like to welcome you to the first panel in the Salon series at Art Basel Hong Kong. Um, over the next 40 minutes or so, um, I will be having a very informal discussion with my lovely, lovely panelists here, Till Felrath, with whom I co-founded Art Reoriented. It's a multidisciplinary curatorial platform based in New York and in Munich. Um, artist Mika Tajima, of course, many of you, I think all of you here know um, Mika, and um, who currently lives in New York, and uh, gallerist Umar Boot from Grey Noise. He's the founder and director of Grey Noise Gallery that is based in Dubai. So this session's panel is entitled Parallel Histories and Abstraction, a very loaded title that, like many things in life, none of us really chose. We were basically given this title and have spent the last few days contemplating what to make out of it and how to transform it into a coherent session. And uh, despite how short the title is, it comprises three very, very loaded words that are layered with so many meanings and pred predicated with a number of contested assumptions. Parallel, histories, and of course, abstraction. By way of providing a basic conceptual framework for our discussions, and before I turn to my fellow panelists here, I would like to briefly unpack some of the strands of meaning and associations that underpin these terms and I would like to start with parallel. In geometry, a basic conceptual framework for our discussion, uh, sorry, in geometry, parallel lines are lines that extend in the same direction. They maintain the same distance from each other. Obviously, they never meet. And I think this is a very unsuitable way to kind of describe art history, which is anything but you know, isolation. It's about the transfer of ideas. It's about the exchange of forms, referencing so many different things, artists kind of working with different materials, different media. It's really not about isolation. It's about things coming together. Sometimes um, it's about conversions, diversions. Sometimes it's about conflict. So it's very interesting to maybe rethink that term parallel and think more in terms of um, things coming together and something else coming out of that. Um, and then the second term that is framing our conversation here is history. And definitely I'm not going to give you a philosophical unpacking of the term of history because we will not leave in about a week or so. Um, but I think it's important to be reminded as we embark on this conversation that history is never objective. Obviously it equally exists in the present as much as it does in the past for it is through the lens of our current predicament and disposition that we read and interpret that which came before us. The narrative that we espouse, or at least conjure up, every time we write a book, we curate an exhibition, we make an artwork, um, is basically something that is very objective and something that is very personal. And maybe to quote very briefly the logic of sense from Gilles Deleuze, you know, he said something very interesting which relates to the work of Mika, which relates to a lot of things that we kind of are interested in. Um, he said, becoming isn't a part of history. History remains, or history amounts only to the set of preconditions, however recent, that one leaves behind in order to become, that is to create something new. And I think basically this is what defines and brings us to the point of abstraction. If anything, abstraction is a process of elimination, of stripping things down to their essence in order to make, you know, um, way for a new visual language, a minimal form of communication, um, and this is probably one framework or some of the ideas that I wanted to throw at you as we kind of embark on some of the things that we're going to talk about. So the first question that I have or the first thing that I would like us to talk about and you will see the images rotating and you will refer, we will refer to them as we speak is to first welcome Mika. It's lovely to have you with us on this panel. We're all big fans of your work. And, um, I wanted to ask you specifically to maybe talk to us a little bit about two particular series of work that you have actually created, and starting with, visual, uh, with negative entropy. Um, it's a work that some of you might know or some of you might have seen before um, that has the guise of an abstract artwork, but we'll let Mika talk to us more about it. So, please. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, I, there, these two bodies of work that you're referring to, negative entropy and then the furniture art um, series of paintings, it, all of the sort of painting objects that I've been dealing with have been um, like mediating it through a sort of process or industrial methodology. Um, but the negative entropy series, which um, is uh, essentially, I think of them as acoustic portraits. Um, they're woven um, fabric that's stretched over um, acoustic paneling, which are, appear like painting. Um, the process of uh, making them um, is, I, um, I visit um, old textile mills and other sort of industrial settings and do sound recordings of the machines working and the, the people who are working there. Um, and those audio files are then um, transcribed into a spectrogram or an image of sound, which then gets uh, rewoven by the machines that I recorded into this, this um, third level of translation into a woven um, fabric painting. Um, and um, yes. So basically, you start with a, something that is very abstract or at least non tangible sound, and then you translate it into an abstract image simply because the digital um, file looks like an abstract shape. It doesn't have a figurative form, which you then transpose or translate into the tapestries that you use as sound bafflers. So you start with something abstract and you keep on removing it into further and further abstraction. But what's interesting, though, is that Mika calls the works acoustic portraits. And a portrait, conventionally speaking, is actually something that is figurative. Yeah, representational. So why, <laughs> representational. So what is, what, it's an interesting dichotomy. What you see appears to be abstract in the more kind of conventional sense, but the title that you give to the work is something that you use to denote something figurative or representational. Can you talk to us a little bit about this dichotomy or this maybe contradiction or tension? Yeah, well, I think it um, stems from um, my interest in what painting can do, or like how painting has been instrumentalized, particularly um, in... Um, uh, I didn't want to get too far back into like my um, research or my um, how all of my work is sort of informed, but essentially I've been, you know, very um, involved in uh, research on like interior corporate architecture design and how painting has been instrumentalized in our lives and in our world to um, function in these other kinds of ways that either control us or change the mood of a space or um, mask something that is occurring. So this idea of like um, having these woven tapestries that appear as some soothing backdrop that's abstract is actually full of content of like labor and, um, and the death of industry or the, the transformation from uh, material or industrial economies into the now information economy that we live, globalization, all these things are sort of like literally woven into this like pattern that is um, uh, just processed information. Um, and, you know, just going back to like describing them, um, putting words to describe something that appears to be something abstract gives it intense um, representation and um, the content is like um, literally um, uh, uh, woven back into the work by giving that context. So um, even the title, it's called the Negative Entropy Series, is a, um, a term that comes from, it's actually a physics term, um, but it's also used in um, economics to describe the idea of like um, a system that's trying to preserve its um, to, to export its entropy, you know, which is death. And so this idea of like portraiture also representing a kind of death. And then the image of an active time, the sound, which has now become death. So there's like these little I think this removals of like... Yeah. This multi-layering makes the work... You, you, you said something, or you kept on saying something, appears to be abstract. Because maybe one of the things that we might want to talk about is that is there such a thing as complete abstraction, something that totally is involved in its form and not in any way trying to refer to some content or some idea or some concept. And this brings me a little bit to Till. We'll come back to you, Mika, to talk about furniture art series in a, in a second. But this brings me to Till, and in particular to one of the artists that we had worked with um, in one of the exhibitions that we did in 2013, and I would like to talk a little bit about that, uh, Paul Giragosian. 
because his work appears to be abstract, but it's very much about the human figure, which is interestingly something that you are very concerned with. So here's a contemporary artist working with the guise of abstraction to comment on spaces in which we exist and how visuals kind of relate to the, to the environments in which our bodies operate. And here's an artist um, that has something similar going on, although he's obviously a modernist who was born in 1925 and passed away in 19, um, 1925, passed away in 1993. So Till, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about Paul Giragosian and... Yes, the image actually just passed. It is that colorful painting that we just saw that um, represents or shows some abstract figures or group of abstract figures. And I think to explain this work, it is very important to quickly uh, point out that Paul Giragosian was a refugee from the um, Armenian genocide in Turkey and then actually went, ended up living in, in Beirut. And I think his whole life was really trying to question or finding a little bit of a yeah, belonging or a sense of rootedness. And he has experienced the horror of a genocide. He also had a stop in uh, Palestine, in Jerusalem, uh, where he was actually accidentally born. But sort of experiencing two displacements, his whole life he was concerned with finding some sort of um, yeah, sense and uh, seeing a lot of people dying. So some sort of sense of a common humanity or something good in human people. And I think his earlier work, when you see it, is really painting figures, but without clear faces oftentimes. So in a sense, what in the majority of his work um, is happening is that he is painting people, but also making a point that while they look different, they share a certain commonality. You also see this group of people that is really close together, but at the same time separate. So there is a sense of belonging, a sense of trying to find shelter in a group, but at the same time also making a point about some sort of commonality in all human beings despite all the differences. <clears throat> now what I want to go on from this particular point and, uh, is that there are different ways also for artists to embark on abstraction. I think for Gita Gossian, and this is why we chose that example here, this is someone that uses it not only in a formalistic, but to a certain extent also in a symbolic meaning. So this quest for maybe a common language, a common humanity. There are a lot of other artists, and we included one example here, for example, from Leo Fan, uh, one of the most prominent artists here who are living and working in Asia. His abstract works are really much more a result of a technique. Now, this is the work just coming up here, where he paints basically blue lines from top to bottom until the paint runs out and he keeps on doing this. So what his work actually shows here is really an act of a result of a process rather than a conscious act to create an abstract work or in a sense reducing something that you know to end up showing something that is reduced or abstracted. So abstraction really is in fact the core tool or the consequence of your process. And in that sense it's a little bit like in a sense, what Mika's work is all about. Thank you. I think what's also interesting um, about what you just said with, with Leo Fan and him kind of being part of the Danzigwa Korean monochrome uh, movement, um, another project that, or another movement that we're very interested in is the fact, and this kind of connects, me, connects us to something that I would like to ask Omar about in a minute, is the fact that when the Danzigwa artists started working, um, they were actually trying to evade any kind of coercion into uh, a nationalist rhetoric. They, they, they consciously moved away from figuration or representation so that their work doesn't become a tool of propaganda by the state. And this was happening obviously in a post-colonial uh, context where they had emerged from the past of the imperial Japanese presence and they were trying to formulate a language that was relevant to them. Funnily enough, when they start getting exhibited in Japan, in the late 60s, early 70s, and then in the first Paris Biennial, um, all the critics start talking to them about reviving traditional Korean art and Zen and the color white, which is exactly what they were trying not to do. They were trying not to be Korean, but trying to understand what it's like to be a contemporary artist looking at arte povera, looking at uh, gestural abstraction, but also being aware of who they are and what their local context is. And in a sense, these associations that we have with artists coming from certain parts of the world is something that plagues a lot of us. Whether you're an artist, you're a curator, you're a historian, people expect you to do certain things or say certain things or be interested in certain topics simply because of where you come from. Um, now, Omar, most of the artists that you work for, you were based in, in Lahore for many years. 
and then you open the gallery in Dubai. And a lot of the artists that you work with are artists either from Pakistan or from the greater region without going into the, the nightmare of trying to understand what the region is, <laughs> okay? But how do, I mean, do you think people have certain expectations when you say, I'm from this place or this artist is from that place? And then what's the response like when they see the work and it probably doesn't correspond to some of these expectations? So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, Grey Noise Gallery's inception was uh, very closely rooted to the idea of uh, geographic uh, representation and the expectation of people that you're running a gallery. I started in Lahore and then moved to Dubai later. Um, I was very clear from the beginning that uh, if I am going to be representing, uh, let's say, artists from Pakistan, I, uh, I'm probably looking at... Uh, <clears throat> works which uh, don't really defy or define what exactly is uh, so South Asian or Pakistani about their practice. And uh, I think um, this was a concern which uh, lingered. And when I moved to Dubai, I mean, I'm in, the, I'm in really the gallery district, the up-and-coming gallery district of uh, the region. And then uh, uh, again, I think uh, the strength became where I was exhibiting artists like Fahad, whose work is on and uh, showing him in Basel and, uh, you know, people coming and asking us that, uh, you know, is this artist, I mean, first, a lot of people didn't even knew where Lahore was. But the point was that um, they don't really uh, practice thinking that they have to represent their own nationality when they're making. It's pretty much to blur that. And I think I'm interested in that sort of representation where people really don't uh, define one, uh, one's practice associated to a city or a country. Um, I think uh, that became uh, a huge question for many people. And then when I was in Dubai, um, uh, like uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, art fairs which we were doing, um, you know, they know that we're in Dubai, of course. And Dubai has a specific uh, vision, you know, as a city, you know. Uh, and then uh, me showing conceptual artists from Beirut uh, in Dubai. Uh, again, when you talk about Lebanon, uh, we have a quite have a very fixed notion on what people practice there. And I'm looking at uh, artists whose work uh, blurs that idea. And I think uh, Kailin uh, from, um, uh, she's uh, Lebanese, uh, again, bought up and uh, later on studying in, in London. Sherbel, um, again, a Lebanese, uh, uh, studying in Paris and coming back. And of course, looking back at what their roots were and then making these uh, notions blurred, which I think uh, is interesting. and. Um, I think this blurring is very, very important. I mean, as you've noticed, one of the slides that we chose to include in the presentation is of uh, traditional Islamic tiles with an arabesque design. And maybe this somehow connects because if you come from a certain part of the world with a predominant culture, people expect you to go back and look at these traditional motifs and always incorporate them in your work, even as a contemporary artist. So while abstraction or arabesque was a particular way to negotiate a certain tenant within um, Islam, not only as a religion, but as a culture. Um, there's a lot of talk today about contemporary Islamic art, while we never hear about contemporary uh, Protestant art, <laughs> for instance. So it might be, it's, it's very interesting how the, all these things connect and in a sense bring us back to a very important point, the individuality of the artist. Whether we're talking about the modern artists like, you know, Leo Fan or Paul Giragosian, um, and we're talking to Mika today, who's with us as an artist, it's important to, to be reminded of this individuality in negotiating whatever you choose to negotiate for whatever reasons and whatever personal concerns. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about another work um, or body of work, uh, Mika, your furniture art. Now, I've heard of furniture music with Eric Satie, so maybe you can tell us a little bit where this is coming from, I love the starting points of Mika's works. They're always very exciting. So, well, that's exactly where the title, the series title, comes from. Is uh, it's um, um, Eric Satie's uh, Musique des Meublements, mu furniture music, and I, I, I thought of that as a very like uh, metaphorical way to think of like, again, going back to um, painting um, as this um, something that becomes uh, used in a and um, in some 
uh, in service of uh, the built environment. And so Eric Satie, he was um, somebody, a modernist composer who um, invented this idea of ambient music, or he called it oral decor. So the music that sunk to the background of other activities. So I thought, oh, this is a nice way to describe painting. Something that would sink to the background in the built environment, be utilized for some other kind of, um, in service of something else, some other activity, which is what I think of a lot, um, what happens a lot in architecture or interior design or corporate world or whatever. The art fairs. Art fairs. <laughs> um, but the, the furniture art series, um, so it is essentially um, thermoformed um, plexiglass or acrylic, um, essentially a shell, a clear shell that holds paint mist. And the painting um, is, the, the paint itself is applied in a spray type manner, sometimes with a um, abstract, geometric abstract um, diagram type um, patterning and sometimes with just color. And this is sort of pointing back to the, the previous sort of topic that um, um, Omer and um, Sam, you're mentioning about like um, the abstraction of ge um, geographic locations because each of those furniture art uh, paintings has a subtitle of a geographic location, a city associated with. So it's furniture art San Diego, furniture art London, furniture art Hong Kong. And so something that has absolutely zero representation, just color, suddenly becomes, again, extremely specific. Like it describes the mood of a place or you have some kind of association with it. Suddenly an image, uh, like psychogeographic uh, connotation is associated with this color. If it's just white, but you call it Aspen, then you think of s snow and a v ski vacation and all these kinds of things, just a white wall, you know. Um, so that's the sort of basis of this um, idea of naming of um, the furniture art series, but it kind of goes back to this topic of like what it means now, like these ge geographic locations, which are completely flattened in a way, like here we are in Hong Kong, all coming from all over the world. And, you know, maybe my painting that's pink could be called Hong Kong or New York, and it would be all the same. <laughs> well, I mean, what, what's really interesting here is I always find that there's a very interesting reference to something that has to do with art criticism or art history. So in the first example, the genre of portraiture with negative entropy. In this particular example, the idea of taste. You know, so if this work is in, you know, Ahmadi uh, in, in Mumbai or if it's in Los Angeles, it would look a certain way or appeal to a certain sensibility. And that's a very interesting critique of associations with taste. Um, and in a sense, as curators, we, we, we sometimes hear some very interesting people talk about abstract art as easy, you know? Oh, it fits with the couch, or it fits in the, you know, we, we get people asking us sometimes, oh, can you advise us on a work? I mean, this is not what I am do, I'm not a decorator, you know? So what's, what's very interesting is um, this kind of um, very, very, the opposition between what people perceive sometimes of abstract art in a very simplistic way and how engaged it is and how actually nothing, there's nothing uh, passive or, or, or kind of um, 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 non unengaged about specifically abstract art. So to go back to the example that I want to go back to tell of Paul Guragosian, you look at the work and obviously it's informed by his personal background, but you see, if you look at the bottom, there are these kind of triangular shapes and these are representations, in a sense, of his negotiation of feet in the murals from ancient Egypt. He spent many years looking at ancient Egyptian art in the Louvre when he was studying in France. But then he was obviously very... Um, he was frequenting a lot of artist studios and artist friends that were working with gestural abstraction. So there's a negotiation of so many visual layers that come out in his own unique style, but at the same time, um, they are referencing specific movements or um, artistic uh, schools or periods. It's nothing, there's nothing you know, passive about it. There's nothing unengaged or easy. If anything, your work and this kind of work is very, very multi-layered. So one of the examples that um, I would like to ask Till to talk about is the example of Piet Mondrian. We all know Piet Mondrian and how abstract his work is. But maybe you can talk to us a little bit about his compositions, the early compositions and where they come from, because yeah. that's interesting about this kind of negotiation and fusing. Sure. sure, I'll do this really quickly because I wanted to then expand on that point a little bit. I mean, Piet Mondrian um, is probably one of the pioneers or considered to be one of the pioneers of abstraction. And we chose one of the earliest abstract compositions here as an illustration. Um, this is a work from 1915. 
that he created when he left Paris because his father was very ill. He went back to, to Holland, back to the Netherlands, to the Dutch coast, to Domburg in particular. And this was also the period that the First, war, first World War was in full swing. So people were dying everywhere and he was very much questioning what's the meaning of life, where do we go, why is this all happening and, and so on. So he was in the Netherlands, it is foggy, you know, he was looking at the sea, sketching and sketching and sketching. And there is a picture from uh, the beach, actually, that you can see. And the result were these really stunning reduced compositions where simply the waves and these wooden plucks to mark, you know, piers simply become lines that at the same time, and this is not coincidental, represent crosses, actually. So you cannot help but make the association with the field of a cemetery that he actually created in this sort of dark period that he was living um, with his father also being very ill. At the same time, what is really interesting, and this is the point that I wanted to make, is that abstraction is considered so often by many people to emerge in the early 20th century. So that painting is about 100 years old now. However, the notion of what is abstract art or how do you represent something really is as old as humanity. And uh, Mika is trying to answer this. And what are we trying to do? How can I show what I really want to say? And it is almost impossible to really represent something 100% real anyway. So pretty much anything, even if you do something figurative, has some form of abstraction or simplification in the way that you will communicate that. And I want to go back to two examples. The first one, we just see a Peter uh, Sandrendam a painting of a Dutch church in the early 17th century. There are other many painters like uh, Gerard Hukes, or so others that have painted similar churches. And the fascinating thing is that it is maybe not unlike what Mondrian was doing a few hundred years later, 300 years later. Actually, it's a, a cathedral in the, you know, post-Reformation war and the separation of the church. You only actually see the geometric shapes in these compositions. You don't really see anything in the church, but what you see is that empty space and the geometric forms of that church. And actually, it, it is really almost as if 300 years later, Mondrian was doing something quite similar. But we can even go back His further. His parents were very Calvinistic Very also. Calvinistic, so absolutely. Up it's a very similar spirit, in fact. It's not really about the church. It's about that space that he's painting. But what's really more interesting, and I think a few of you might have wondered, what is that Neolithic, uh, early Paleolithic um, stone doing there, these carvings that are about 70,000 years old? Well, this is the oldest uh, structure that was very recently discovered that was ever, you know, man-made, man-made drawings or sketchings. And you see these are some geometric shapes. Um, and this was discovered thinking that the earliest uh, man-made forms of communication or depictions were about 25, 30,000 years old. And all of a sudden, this piece pops up. And the discussion around it is really fascinating because the discussion is not really what it is and why it is, but the discussion really is, is that an accidental geometric scribble, so to speak? Or do these geometric forms mean something? And when you think about this discussion, this is the core really of also representation and abstraction nowadays. So are we doing geometric shapes because they are symbolic or simply because they make a certain visual impact? Or are we making these geometric shapes because they mean something? Or is it in essence an abstracted form of actually communicating something? And I think this example is so fascinating because that uh, carving is more, about 70,000 years old. And I think this form of how we represent and what is abstract and what is figurative or concrete is really as old as humanity itself. And I think this is something to reconsider maybe how we look at art and how we look even at art history at large. Thank you, Till. I think you're touching on a very interesting point here, which is, you know, there's the artwork, the intention of the artist, um, abstract or non-abstract, you know, what the artist was thinking of, what they were trying to communicate. And then there are all the readings or the framings that we bring to the artwork or all the agencies that we project upon the artwork in order to serve all sorts of different reasons. So since we're talking about abstraction, I just would like to give you one example before I uh, turn to Omar one more time. Um, it's very interesting, for instance, that in the wake of the Cold War, and this is something that maybe some of you know already, um, the, there was a very strong political framing of abstract expressionism in the U.S. as a distinct American counterposition to the social realism that was predominant, for instance, in most post-World War II communist countries. So at the height of the Cold War, leading American critics and historians such as John Kennedy, of course, Clement Greenberg, uh, Leo Steinberg, they all celebrated and promoted abstract expressionism as the culmination of a pure art, a marker of rebellion, 
against both political and aesthetic agendas. So the CIA's um, International Cooperation Department, not so many people know that, were actually funding, they were very, very active in kind of like playing a leading role in promoting abstract American abstract expressionism um, in international exhibitions elsewhere, sometimes paying artists to go and do workshops, you know, in Japan. When, when, when Pollock went to Japan, for instance. I mean, it's crazy when you think that something that seems to be so personal, coming from a very formalistic point of uh, departure point, becomes a, a political tool to stand against, you know, social realism that is the communist form of art. Um, so it's very interesting how these readings come into play and transform or sometimes completely obliterate uh, the original intention of the artist. Um, so, Umar. How often are the original intentions of the artists you work with completely obliterated <laughs> or eliminated, let's say, or misread, at least, or appreciated in the context of specifically the gallery being in Dubai? Um, what kind of audience do you have? And how do they respond to the abstract elements in the work of the artist that you represent? Is it easier to show figurative art? I mean, talk to us a little bit about that. I think it's uh, it's 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 quite uh, I mean uh, obvious that um, Dubai is um, a city which has um, uh, grown uh, in, in a very short period of time. And um, I mean, I grew up there in a very different atmosphere in the 80s to what it is now. Um, of course, it's easier to uh, if, if if I have a if I have a visitor, uh, not per se, let's say if not even a collector, somebody comes and looks at a work, uh, they re they try to of course extract some reading of it, uh, and it's very obvious Fahad Barki's work, which we showed in the gallery. I mean, uh, uh, there is a, a clear uh, uh, symbolic presence of let's say the eyes, the two circles, and uh, you know they look very at anthropomorphic it. Anthropomorphic. In, in fact, certainly, and then you. You do read these uh, notions, but at the same time, um, it's, uh, it's, it, it is challenging. And I think that challenge is uh, my role or duty to sort of educate and uh, infiltrate in their brains and then open them up a bit more. So the, the reception and the reading uh, is also expanding. And that's what pretty much the role of a gallery is, other than just uh, hunting and looking at new forms of practice. Sure. So. Um, it, it is a new trajectory. I mean, uh, we, we take a, a bit of risk uh, at the same time. That is uh, motivational. Of course, you can show a representational show and uh, uh, make it uh, more accessible. But that's what I enjoy uh, in, in the process of representation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I think this is pretty much what we would like to say. What would be more interesting now is maybe to open up the the floor and see if anyone would like to add something or ask a question to any one of our panelists or comment on something, so please feel free to do so. Yes, please, Kevin. Yeah, I'm, I'm not actually sure you completely answered um, the question about in, intent. And I'm, I, I find it an interesting one of knowing, especially your, your gallery quite well. I mean, the, the, the difference between when you present an artist who, even beyond abstraction, I mean, some of the more conceptual people that you um, represent, like you spoke about Trabeau. I mean, the, how that reception, I find that you kind of are always forced to go back to the artist's intention, right? You explain to someone, well, he meant this. And I think also we, we work around this idea of, of, of artistic individuality, as you, as you mentioned earlier, but a lot of that comes down to, you know, uh, you know the, the intent, the kind of motivation that, that, that they had when they, when they picked up, you know, whatever tool they used to, to create what they did. And I wonder, is that really something that we, we need to keep on working at? Is that something that we, because I, I find Mika's work is, is very beyond all of that. That individuality is there, but the personality uh, of Mika is completely absent from, uh, from, from, from the work, I find, even though she works very much with the body and very much with, with experiences that she has had to go through. So I'm, I'm just curious about how you 
you know, is that is that always a default mode of of, explana of explaining abstract art to us today? To go back to what the art, what the what the artist meant to do. May, maybe to kind of deflate the not deflate, but kind of transfer the question. Um, let's let's actually ask Mika, and then of course Omar. Um, how do you talk about your work generally? I mean, do, do you think that your personal intention behind the work is a very important thing that you would like to communicate when you're asked about your work? Or is this something that kind of recedes a little bit into the background and you try to approach it through another lens or through other channels that probably are more important to you that they get communicated to whoever is asking? I, I, was that, was the question clear or maybe yeah I I'm trying to <laughs> think of how to approach it well I guess let me if I'm understanding correctly the I mean the intent I mean the content of the work both the process and the the conceptual sort of grounding for these things is absolutely essential I think in the reading of the work I mean for me if Without the content, it is just a piece of fabric or just a, some object that with no meaning, you know. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering actually what you were saying um, that you, the, the, I, I just want a clarification on um, when you say that, the, that there's an absence of personality. A, a personality or something. I'm just like, interested in what you can clarify that. Yeah, well, I find that you, you, you root it in some place else, right? You don't root it. You, this, these are experiences that you're having, right? You're listening, you're listening to something. You have to hear something almost first. You, 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 you record that sound somehow. So you're involved in the, in, in the reception of that sound, correct? You're there while the, while the machine is recording it. So, but, but there's a distance between you and the actual work at the end. I mean, you, you, you link the furniture to some place geographically, so there's no kind of... Uh, I find that, that there's an absence of, uh, uh, of the person. W completely different from something like Charbel, where you are expected to believe that those are his tears or his cigarette being, be, being smoked. Sorry to bring this into non-abstract uh, I understand, place. but uh, I think that, um, again, uh, as you said, uh, we don't have anything of Sherbel, but we're talking about an artist, uh, just for your knowledge, uh, whom I work with. Um, it's just the presence of the tears in the gallery, which I guess uh, are unexpected somehow, which makes things a bit more interesting. Although uh, uh, this whole element of interaction with a work which uh, is a uh, as simple as collecting tears, you know, and separating them. Um, that itself, for a viewer or somebody engaging with, uh, they don't expect these things somehow, at least in the context of where we are right now. It's this, that, I think, and then I know personality, I don't know, I'm not a I, bit I, sure. I have a problem with that, actually, because I don't, I don't think that that's something that, I mean, that's like coming down to a question of like, you know, I don't know, I don't think that's even an interesting point. Because then it's saying like, because I haven't touched the work that it's, you know, doesn't have any intent I mean, or... And, and maybe it, the question to ask is, is it ever possible to dissociate the, the work from the process? And the process is coming from personal choices that the artist makes and personal choices are a reflection of that person. So, in a sense, it's always there somehow, um, and the, the lines are blurred. You can't say this is where the personality appears the most, and this is where something is borrowed from something else. I think it's the whole, it's the way that all these elements live together that lend the work its authenticity, in a sense, or it's it being a reflection of something that is truthful to whatever you are interested in or searching for at a particular moment. Um, should, want do you want to say maybe, something yeah, and then maybe we can ah, give another... Okay, okay Charles? I just want to um, say that, uh, that the issue of abstraction seems... I mean, it, it may have been said in, in other ways, but uh, seems to me to be 
very much about uh, stopping time, about an interval in time, about the a resistance to time on the part of an individual. But I, I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm very hesitant to go down the path of individuality. Uh, George Bataille wrote a book about art. I mean, he wrote a lot of things, but he also wrote about art, and he, he focused on cave paintings, on Paleolithic painting. And he was interested in the idea of touch, of the idea of the mark. And it seems to me that within the, within the contemporary uh, framework that um, to start to put representation in opposition to abstraction actually is a false, a false path. They seem to me to be much more related than perhaps, you know, that kind of argument permits. Uh, because I think, I mean, representation is a different way of making a mark, a different way of interrupt, interrupting time. So, it, I mean, I guess I'm still a humanist, and I mean, but, the, but there is some, something profoundly human about this idea of abstraction uh, yeah. in terms of this mark making, in terms of this, the, this checking of time, this interval in time, this, we are here, we are making a mark, we are stopping time even for a split second. So, following on from your point about the stopping of time, could we, could we argue, and this is just an open question, that the ultimate kind of um, liberation of art from time is to completely erase the imprint of the artist, so there's no signature, we don't even know who the artist is, and therefore we can't locate it within a particular personality, place, region. I wanted to say something about when you said uh, representation and figuration. It made me think of something that is actually quite ironic. You know, when, when you look at this group of the Tansekwa artists, these Korean um, modernists, I suppose you would call them, uh, painters, uh, when they were working or when they were showcasing their works in uh, exhibitions in Paris pretty early on, ironically, these abstract works began taking a meaning, at least for certain critics and audiences, that they were representing some sort of Asian culture, some sort of Zen-ness or something, when in fact the works were really very political, in fact, you know, in the wake of uh, the, Korean, the end of the Korean occupation, the Korean War. So the works are actually very political in, in a sense, a form of resistance, the complete uh, lack of any color the way that the canvas was treated um, is actually almost quite violent. You know, there's a lot of rubbing and scratching and pushing. So it is actually quite far from some sort of Zen garden or something like that, that it actually ended up misrepresenting, in a sense, when it is shown in different cultures and contexts. So I think the question of how even abstraction is perceived based on its place of origin and what it would mean is actually very confusing. So a painting that may look exactly the same, when I show it in one place, may mean something. When I tell you that the artist is coming from a certain place of the world may mean something else when really the paintings look exactly the same. So even in abstraction, I think you cannot get away from these things. And uh, I think the way to go about it, and this is to answer a little bit your question, I think you always have to embrace at the end of the day the artist and that personal viewpoint and understand where a particular person is coming from, both as an individual with a personal life story, but also at the end of the day when and where that work was created. You know, when you look at Piet Mondrian, you cannot really understand these works if you don't know that the First World War was going on, that he was about to lose his father, and why he was contemplating those kind of things and solutions that he found. I think you always have to do both, maybe not overemphasize the origin, but at the same time, you know, you simply cannot really understand the work truly if you don't really spend the time and effort to go a little bit behind that individual story. Thank you, Till. I think we have time just for one question, or if not, we will... Anybody would like to ask anything or give an observation? If not, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure talking to you guys, and we learned a lot from listening to you. Thank you for coming, and um, have a good continuation. Okay. <laughs>